Genau. Hello, this is a nice small group. This is a small group for the moment here in the room. Maybe there are more people listening on the, on the screen what is happening right here. We are here explaining the German water sector in about less than one hour. Well, German water sector in a nutshell. Sometimes it's a little bit challenge, um, but I have done this a couple of times in other opportunities, uh, especially in trade fairs, I thought something like that. Normally I have one and a half hours. So maybe I'm rushing through the thing a little bit. I have cut off some parts of the presentation. Um, but always the way you can lift your arm, you can raise questions. When it's too much question, I will tell you, okay? This is interactive, this is for you here. And so then let's start. Oh, the microphone jumping from one to the other is working fine. I'm Roland Knitschke, I'm working for the German Association for Water, Wastewater and Waste. This is a German technical, a technical scientific association developing technical standards for the German water sector and running about 300 trainings a year. So we're the biggest training provider in the fields of wastewater, sewage, rivers, dikes, dams, water management. And a small part of DWA is caring about international issues, but we are here to look for the German water sector. So, Who's first time here in the hall in Germany? All have a lot of experience. You? First time. So we are here in the middle, no? Over there in the center of Germany, of Europe. This is important for me. A part of that, um, these are some general figures. Uh, we have here the separation, uh, division of Germany in 16 federal states. This is important for the water sector to understand. Europe is important, and the federal states, because a lot of these factors of water management are in the hand of the federal states and not as a German national governmental thing. We have a lot of rainfall, or a normal rainfall here, about 700 and uh, 1,000 millimeters per year, and it's well distributed over the years. You see it here on the, on the, on the right hand, on the picture, the temperature coming from zero to 20 degrees average, and the Precipitation is more or less equal over the years. The question for me is to bring all this into a concept that you can follow what is happening in the water sector now. So I make a, made a, a role or a, a circle of water sector um, roles starting from water resources. We already had this short view. Um, then I will talk about water supply and about uh, drainage coming to the wastewater field. At the bottom we are talking about a little bit digitalization, a little bit about jobs and things like that. And then talking about river maintains, European Water Framework Directive, Work Framework Directive. I will um, explain very shortly. Then we come a little bit to the field of urban water, climate aspects, and finishing with the topic of groundwater. Because Groundwater and water protection of, uh, protection of groundwater zones is the basic, again, to start with water supply. So, one circle around, see sections. Let's start with the first section about resources, water supply, and operators. We have a lot of water in Germany, nearly 200 billion cubic meters per year, and we only need a small part of that. The main part of, um, of the water is gone with the rivers to the sea. When we are taking this part of the cake, we will see that the majority, 30, or the, from this 25 billion cubic meters, the majority of that is again used for energy supply. Energy supply in Germany means not, hydro, not, so, not so much hydropower, but for example, using the water for cooling water with, um, uh, with, uh, no, with uh, uh, no, no, coal power plants, uh, coal power plants and things like that. Um, so this water is used, but it comes back to the river. So this reuse of water somehow, or the multiple use of water in Germany is popular. Same with water supply, you see here with 12% of the cake, um, 
which comes back to the rivers and maybe the water you have drunken or used for, for um, power plants in the upper Rhine is reused in Cologne to take it out of the river again. The second part in relevance is chemical industry. So you see, water supply is not the big issue here. It's one part of a bigger kick. This is a map talking about drinking water resources and their distribution in Germany. And you see the more red areas, which are this um, uh, industrial areas. Here's the city of Cologne, where you have not, uh, you don't have sufficient water resources directly close to the city, but you have the green areas, which serve as recharge areas, and we have this limit, this way of bulk supply. Thank you. Um, for students, I recommend to uh, make a photo of this here, um, of, of the website, because there you find, even in English language, very good information about resources management in Germany. Even other maps you find over there. And you see here in the map this long lines from the mountains to the, um, to the uh, uh, industrial areas here up there to Hamburg. Here is Munich, for example, getting the water from the Alps. This is a logic how we manage our distribution of water. The idea is old. Even the Romans, who had been here um, uh, living in, in Germany or conquering Germany 2,000 years ago, they had even aqueducts or uh, con conducts uh, of water from the mountains to the city of Cologne. This is a cross cut through one of these buildings. At the moment, we have one of this standing in our headquarter at DWA, close to no, 20 kilometers from here. But what you can see when you go close to this construction, you see that this building, this conduct, had been designed in a standardized way. All over the European, uh, uh, Roman Empire, it was the same. Yeah? And they had different ceilings here and uh, uh, ash layers which made the um, water, uh, the, uh, the eliminated uh, microorganisms, and at the end, something as a cover of chalk, things like that. Yeah? Really interesting first process of standardization in the water sector from Roman Empire. When the Romans went away and went back to Rome, um, Germany entered a little bit in a, yeah, in, a, up, up, uh, in, in, in a desert, or it was it fall back into the medieval, we can call it like that. And it took um, 1,000 years until there was a renewment of, of water use, not only a well or taking it out of a lake, but uh, using water power for mining, for silver mining and for metal mining. Uh, to use water wheels, and with these water wheels, pumping the water out of the, the, uh, the mines. So then in the 18th century, we come back that we could use this water power again for civilization, but this was for the castles. We have very nice castles in Germany, ne? and some of them have these nice water games or water, water um, fountains. If you have the opportunity to go to Kassel, to go to Bayreuth or different places, Enjoy it. Um, it took more time, 100 years more, until the normal civilization, normal uh, population got access to water. Uh, but this will be here a bit, little bit later. Nowadays, we are here in the situation that we can uh, call, uh, talk about a uh, full water connection rate of 99%. Our water consumption is about 130 liters per person. Um, this is okay for an industrialized country, but have in mind the, um, the, the water losses here are only 7-8%, and these are technical water losses, because we are using the water in a lim uh, not flushing the, the, the pipes sufficiently, we have to flush the pipes with additional water. So this is fine from the, from the, from the surface. The clean water supply network is important because we have this 24-7 service and you can drink water out of the taps. We do not, um, we do not chlori chlorine our water. Normally, from the bio bio microbiological point of view, it's clean enough that you can 
take it, uh, put it directly into the water network. What you need to do is you have to eliminate mangan, iron, and things like that. When you have superficial, uh, superficial water or from the uh, surface water, um, then you have to do some uh, contamination, you know, some uh, disinfection work. I think here there will be a, an excursion to the Warnbachtal sperre to a big reservoir. We will see a photo a little bit later. There they have a treatment which cares about disinfection. But the major, majority of the water we come drinking here comes from the groundwater, so no disinfection needed. Who's responsible? In this paper, I will start at the bottom. Yeah? For water supply and wastewater, the responsibility is with the municipalities. There is in our constitution, there is a phrase about the municipality has to cover the basic needs. So at the end, the mayor and the town council decides about the water tariffs. It's completely decentralized. Between the national government, I already told you, it's not responsible really for the water. They only have a water framework. And the town council, there are two levels of water authority, a higher and a lower one. One is for the federal states, who at the same time are relevant for the legislation for the water sector. And the other one is for the smaller issues about water management and getting water rights and things like that. Questions up to this point? It's a very, we go very rough through the things. When you are at home in a water sector in some country of the world, it's easy for you to identify this is the same, this is different. Yes? Yeah. Anna. I think in a lot of parts of the, I know we didn't, we forgot to give you a microphone, so I have to repeat the question. <laughs> uh, places in Germany where we use non-portable water for, for works, cleaning streets, something like that. Uh, this is a technical water. In most cases, it's clean enough, or it's reused water, which, um, but this doesn't make a quantity. In industrial area, it's very common. In other area, you have, the use of water in the field of uh, when you are talking about uh, uh, catching of rainwater from the roofs, this water is not drinking water. And when you come, for example, to, to our DWA as an as a office, the toilets are flashed with water which is not portable water. But this requires two lines. In the majority of the houses, it's one system you flush with portable water, your toilets. So. I told, uh, told you that uh, in Germany, the municipality is responsible for water issues or for water supply. The municipality, and how do they organize it? There are different forms how to organize it. And when we are talking about privatization in the water sector, we have all different models in Germany. In every city is a little bit different. And you can see it a little bit in a line like that I put over here. The easiest one is there is a department in the municipality um, responsible for water supply. Same for wastewater. Yeah? Um, but in some cases, it's not a good idea because uh, when the, the budget of the drinking water supply is in the hand of the municipality and of the town council, they easily will spend the money which is for investment in about 15 years to use it right now for a new kindergarten or something like that. So a lot of cities already said very early, uh, we make a separate company, uh, owner-operated util uh, municipal utility out of it, or a little bit more, we make an institution under public law, more independ independency. Yeah? Or one step more, we want even to be independent in our personal decisions, so we make a public law company, which is completely, a completely independent company, which is out of, the, out of the frame of the public service or our servants' rules and something like that, up to the point that we have a lot of cooperation models between real private partners running drinking water and water supply. You can spend one week 
in this issue here in Germany, studying everything in depth. There is one idea about that which I think which is relatively helpful. Um, we try to build up associations, operators associations. Three different levels. One is the very small villages. You have here the valley over there, yeah, Bavarian Valley, and the villages about 3,500 inhabitants, something like that. They come together, make their small wastewater or wastewater system, run it together in an agreement, an association. The other thing is a big association. This is not in Westphalia, our federal state here is Cologne. Here's the industrial order, uh, area of the Ruhr, of the River Ruhr and River, uh, uh, River uh, uh, Emscher. And in this area over here, um, they have mining activities. And the mining is in, has a lot of influence in, uh, in the groundwater. So it's not possible to manage this by community. Because the community here in this yellow area, there are 40 communities, 40 big cities, living 10,000, 10 million people in that region. It's a mega city somehow, but 14 independent municipalities. This group is formed an association by law. They say, you have to do the thing together. So all municipalities have to contribute to one operator. This is an idea, it's about 130 years old. Yeah? It's working fine until now. And the, also oh, this is the last one. And then there are some other here in the middle, the water supply association. This is, the, for example, the, um, the bulk supplier you are going to visit on the, on the excursion, or some of you are going to visit on the excursion the next days. And uh, this means a couple of cities go together to manage one source together. You remember the red lines we had in the maps over there, bulk supply. So, and to this point, who's paying the bill? Consumers paying the bill. Here I have a simple example of a, of a, a calculation of a water bill. Everyone gets to his house. And what we are paying is, first of all, our freshwater consumption. So water is metered in each house, each flat. And you pay according to that. The second one is, in some cases, rainwater is connected, rainwater uh, discharge is connected to the sewer network. In this case, you even have to pay for the area, as you see over there, of your parcel, the sealed area of your parcel, which is entering into the sewer system. The idea behind this, you're paying for the tapped water, you're paying for the same amount of wastewater, you don't you are not uh, measuring or metering the wastewater, but this is agreement between the two, maybe two different uh, institutions. And um, a part of that, you pay a charge for the precipitation for the sealed areas, because you need sewer areas and things like that. And there is a political reason behind, because we don't want too much rainwater in the sewer system. It has to be bigger, more expensive, things like that. There is some basic fees, and um, but I think it makes lot more or less clear. This p family is paying about 600 euro, euro a year. Um, Cologne, where this example comes from, is relatively cheap. When I'm looking for um, for uh, averages, I coming to uh, drinking water of 150 to 250. Uh, euro per cubic meter, and I'm coming to wastewater, more expensive, for about three, four, five, up to eight euros per meter, uh, for, per um, uh, uh, cubic meter. Yes, please. The costs are different because I told you each water supply and wastewater is in the hand of the municipalities. So each municipality, each town council has to make its own calculation. When it's a big town, everything close together, big sewers, flat area, no pumping costs, easy. When it's a widespread community, they have to say, ooh, what to do, yeah? Good thing is that you cannot make a guilty man in the ministry, yeah? You have, and on the other hand, each of the, or the all, um, all uh, mayors want cheap water prices, but on the other hand, cannot leave the community without long-term investment. 
So the things are close together. This, this decentralized system runs very well. Please. Now you're paying a price for the sealed area of your ground, exactly. the roof or the parking place. And, and, and the base. But is, is it uh, different from the tax you pay for the land use? Yes, the yes. Property? There is one tax for as a ground owner you have to pay. Mm -hmm. But this is, you can change it when you say uh, there is no fixed parking place, there is a sand ditch where I park my cars. <laughs> you don't pay nothing for that. It's working. Or the philosophy to filtrate as much as possible in your own terrains. So in this federal state, not in Westphalia, for example, when you're building up a new house, uh, the first option you have to check is if you can filtrate in the ground directly. Yeah, Make some ditch, something like that. But it doesn't work in all places. No? And it's not the same in all federal states. But <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. When you want to go deeper into that field, I recommend you this publication, Profile of the German Water Sector. For people interested, I have here the former version in English printed, and have a look inside later out here. Um, but this is in English, and this is available, and it's made by the different associations you see here at the bottom. And these different associations come together and every five years make a bench. It's a Frenchly benchmarking report. But there you find pictures about the associations, uh, about the uh, operators, types of operators. You find about the water consumption, wastewater, and all this. Good literature. So up to this point, any question? Drinking water? Then I continue. If you want, you can come to the front, no problem, or stay over there. Highly welcome. <laughs> We're entering into the field of wastewater. A little bit of his history and a little bit of management tools. Most of our think wastewater treatment has to do with wastewater treatment plant. The biggest issue, at least in a country like ours for wastewater, is a sewer network. Sewer network. It's a hidden, it's a dicked asset. Two-thirds of the money we invest in this way, wastewater is much more expensive than drinking water, yeah, the infrastructure. Um, and two-thirds of the costs are dicked into the ground. So what we are doing as German Association, we make every five years a study about how is the situation in, our, in, the, in the sewer networks, drains, and tubes. And here, for example, here you see a picture of tubes in different sites. Yeah, um, from uh, the, the networks in different sizes of communities. In the big communities you see over here, the smaller than 10,000 is over here. And the small cities you see, the majority of the tubes, or the this network, has about up to 25, maybe 50 years of age. But when you go over there to the big cities, you see that a big part, the blue ones, they are all more than 50 years. 70, 100 years, even you have the gray one are um, uh, tubes which are, or sewer systems which are older than 100 years. We talked about it's expensive to build them, so it makes a lot of sense to maintain them. Yeah? And this is uh, this widening, but mainly maintaining an existing sewer system is one of the challenges in our sector. We can do it with a lot of technology, um, inline uh, sewer rehabilitations, and, uh, but inspecting, this is one of these older, but I think I have other pictures coming. First of all, I want to talk, there's always a question, combined system or separate system? I don't know how it's in your countries, we have both. For historical reasons and whatever, in the south it's more the combined system, in the north it's more the separate system. Yeah, the question of which one water is to pump in the south, it's more mountainous, in the north it's more flat, things like that. But we have both, and, but the, the, the way obviously is going to have more separate systems. This is clear because the treatment of wastewater from the households is one thing, and in the combined system the same water comes to the treatment plant 
with storm water together. And uh, for a longer time, there was no really need to clean up drink, uh, uh, storm water, but now it comes, but it's another level of treatment needed. So it makes sense to have the streams in parallel. Other important aspect is there is standards for everything. This are only the European standards from the European the Center of uh, European Normalization, the CIN, the European standards related to, to uh, household wastewater and so on. In the frame of the European standards, there is a DEAN, the German Institute of Normalization. They care about product standards, pipes, something like that, but they don't care about the construction, they don't care about the management and the design. Yeah? So this is done by, where is it? Ah, by, by special organizations, of, uh, special associations in Germany, DWA, and for the drinking water, it's a DVGW, German Association for Gas and Water, or Water and Gas. So this is a set coming from the European standards, which are obligatory for all, through the dean, and then coming to the level of specialists association. DWA is one of them. The DVGW see over here now has 150 years. It was founded together with the gas questions in 19, 1857, I think, something like that. And um, here starts a story with the centralized systems, 1850. It started with a big catastrophe. It started with a city fire in, uh, in Hamburg. At that time, there was a piped water distribution system, but it was not sufficient, not sufficient for fire, dis uh, fire um, uh, fighting. And so they had this catastrophe and had to build up a complete new system for the city of Hamburg. For that time, the Germans asked for development aid from the British, from the Englishmen, uh, from William Lindley and people like that coming to Germany, bringing the, in the concept hygiene and things like that, and building up wastewater, drinking water system, and at the same, a sewer, a same moment, a sewer system. In the following years, a lot of cities followed. The big city followed the same logic. In Berlin, the same. In Cologne, this is something out of the sewer system of Cologne. It's, now it's a rainwater a discharge system, and it's a special place. They call it um, uh, lightning uh, room. You even in special, at some moments when the water is not high, you can make concerts, jazz concerts sometimes, uh, sometimes out there, because it has a special acoustic, you can imagine. This is Cologne. This has been Cologne doing the big digging works for the main sewer system, which is horrible for the city. And obviously, there was, is the idea to implement some mechanical, um, mechanical uh, cleaning. This is the oldest mechanical wastewater treatment plant we have in, had in Germany, in Frankfurt. It worked until, I think, 20 years ago as a preliminary step for further treatment. And what you see here, this is a building. What was the perception of people in that time about wastewater? Look. We are building a castle. We are building something which really is, it helps us. It's hygiene developing there. Yeah? This was the idea. It was not outside, it was visible. The main part of the rainwater in, or water in that time went to sewage farms, to areas like that. Nowadays, they are out close to the city. Nowadays, they are settled with nice villages. Some of them have problems with heavy metals now in the ground but they manage the issue. Because um, originally this wastewater, it was only wastewater for the sewer, uh, for, for, from the washing and from the rain. It was not from the, uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the toilet. For the latrines, there was a different business. At that time, in the eight, end of the 18th century, this was fertilizer. There were people getting the sewage from the latrines and selling it to the farmers. So it was a product. This changed completely when um, and the, the alternative was some guano from the islands of, of Falkland and South Africa, South America, something like that, more expensive. Yeah? 
Um, this changed completely when uh, chemists Harbour Bosch developed their first uh, mechanics to produce nitrogen fertilizer in a chemical way. At that point, this was a change in logic. At this point, it was cheaper to take the other chemical fertilizer. And at that moment, they thought, more to do now with my latrines in the, here are the flats, and here on halfway of the stairs, there are the centralized latrines for one flat. Um, what to do? Yeah, put it to the network. This was the idea about 100 years ago, or 110 years ago, change in paradigm. And at that moment, they started putting it to the sewer system. And at that point, it started that the wastewater became different. Yeah, No more this sewage farms. But now we needed some treatment. We needed treatment because the facilities are inside. The organic matter has increased. The contamination is much more critical. Yeah, There were people like uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Imhoff with the Imhoff tank over there. This is a system to make a mechanical, anaerobe treatment of sewage and water at the same time. Fine. Having in mind this, at the same time, this active sludge technology was developed in Britain and came over stepwise to Germany too. But when we go nowadays, uh, what they had that time at that time was a little bit split system, yeah? Changing into one central flush system. When we go nowadays to Hamburg, Maybe a couple of you know, they have built up a completely new area, a new uh, quarter of, 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 of city, which has completely separate streams of rainwater, of, uh, of sewage water, and black water. Yeah? So when we start in Germany, would start in Germany from scratch anew, I'm sure we would not go the same way as we have done 100 years ago. This is important to have in mind. So, coming a little bit ahead, um, with our tre simple treatment plants, we got some problems. In the 70s, in the 80s, we had green rivers. We had the problems of fertilization in the, in the rivers. We had the problems of uh, sea seals, I think is this animal, no? Is this seal? Of seals, uh, dead seals, because of, uh, from, uh, of, 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 uh, of pesticides, things like that. We had to care, care more about the water quality. So, to make you visible what happened over there, this was the mechan central mechanical treatment plant of Cologne. In the 50s, built on the green flat area, the first centralized for all the city of Cologne with one million inhabitants at that time, more or less. In the 17th, they built active sludge over there, to eliminate the organic carbon, yeah? When you're careful looking over there, you see this is an old plant, still running. Then, in the 19th, this was, after that came the green, the green rivers, the problems of fertilization in, in the rivers. In the 19th, they built up, extended the active sludge process, yeah? And here again, you have the old plant. So, same size of community, Increasing size of plant because additional steps of treatment. And now we are in the situation that we say, is there the need for a fourth treatment step? Where is the terrain for such a fourth treatment step? Who is paying the bill for such a fourth treatment step? Um, I told you in Germany we are doing the things in accordance to the Europe situation, we have a European wastewater treatment directive from the 90s, and recently in this year they are adapting it, renewing it, and trying to get out of the best out of all European states and make a new, di new directive out of that. It's under discussion in the moment, and when we are looking a little bit between the pages, what we will see there is that the, the idea of energy efficiency will come up as a obligatory requirement. This means all the questions of sludge digestion. Yeah? In Germany, this is done. Other, people, other countries have to do with it. Um, on the other hand, an interesting point is, what's about this micro pollutions? Yeah? The cosmetics, what's about the, um, uh, the germs? What about the, um, uh, the, the microplastics? How to treat them? And there they have, because this is a, cost, a thing which will develop a lot of costs, no? and there they said, 
the idea for the moment is, um, yes, we will set some standards, higher standards, on the elimination of micropollutions, but we will charge for that the industry with the idea to have a steering mechanism that the industry will change their products. And so there is no need to produce a lot of this forced treatment step. This is somehow one idea behind. Another important thing, not so much for Germany, but for other countries, is that until now there was a limit of 2,000 populations to be connected to a wastewater treatment plant, or a wastewater system, yeah? Um, and now they will reduce it even smaller villages, up to 1,000, should have a designed and a centralized wastewater system. So this is the way how it works, but we have to look into the notices and uh, the news and be uh, attentive or check the website of DWA, and there you will find all this. <laughs> These are the old values of treatment we have in Germany. You cannot read it. It's too small. This is easier to read. Yeah. Um, what we do, first of all, is in Germany, we classify our plants in very small one, very big one. We have 235 big one, more than 100,000, and we have a lot of very small one, smaller than 1,000 you see over here. Yeah? So for the different sizes of wastewater treatment plants, we have different treatment values. This means when you have a big plant, with a high load, um, uh, high, um, uh, high uh, level of, uh, of a population, population equivalence, you have to clean up much more than a smaller. Even for the very small plants, they don't have to care about, um, uh, about phosphate, for example, or about nitrate. What counts at the end is what comes to the river. Here you see the um, uh, degradation or treatment rates over there. So far, questions up to this point? If you want to read more, what we are doing is for each IFAT fair, we make one of these journals. And in these journals, there is a QR code. There you find a performance report of municipality treatment plants collecting the real data from about 800 different treatment plants, different sizes, different regions, different technologies. If you want to read more, this is the literature you need. So this is a normal 15 personal equivalent uh, treatment plant at the moment, close to our, over there is a DWA headquarter. For me, it's important that we have this picture over here, and that we see the different colors, that we see the primary treatment, that we see the secondary treatment, that you see all this part here is related to sludge. Even a small treatment plant of 9,000, 10,000 cubic meters a day has its own digester, has its own co-generation co generation plant, all these things. It's a standard here in our area. And have in mind, this plant is more than 100 years too. You don't see it? But over here, there is a small old building from one of the first treatment plants. And they are reusing the tanks, increasing technology, reusing existing infrastructure. So we have no standard treatment plant. Everything is rebuilt a little bit over the years in a different way. Yeah, how to operate all this? Um, we have a system here in Germany, a part of this ISO auditing systems. Uh, we have a system in Germany called technical safety management. The idea behind that is that the association is checking the management of a plant. This works for drinking water, wastewater, dams, whatever. Is checking the management of the band, uh, of, of the infrastructure, if they are following all regulations and standards. They do it with a transparent question catalog, which is tackling at the end these different points is the structure of you, the utility without overlapping something like that. Is the organization of the processes might, uh, developed in a smooth way and good, fine designed? And are there the sufficient emergency rules and duties and things like that in place? 
When you're going through a catalog of this, three points of view, having that in a good question catalog, you're very close to a smoothly running um, uh, uh, management. You even can do it by yourself. You don't need any consultant because you have the questions, you can look into the, the, the guidelines and so on. This concept of technical safety management is working very well. It's working even internationally in Egypt, in Jordan, and recently I'm coming back, I came back from, from Peru where I start presenting, uh, developing it or uh, introducing it in Spanish language. Clear, it all depends on the national standards at that moment. No? And sometimes when you say, oh, there is a question, we don't have a national standard, what to do then? Then you have to think somehow in good practice. And when one plant is thinking in good practice, the second is thinking in good practice, and the third, the fourth, we look, what do the other do? So stepwise, by taking the questions and bringing in plants or the managements in using that, we come in a logic of ah, standardization from, from the bottom up. No? It's interesting. It's working. Slash. Fickle, uh, no, not fecal sludge, this is not a topic, topic in Germany, but active sludge treatment residuals. This sludge um, is used, is, uh, is digested in all over Germany. No? We are in the face of changing paradigms at the moment. This is seven years ago, 50%, 60% discharge, thermal discharge. This was agricultural and landscape gardening. This is a recent picture, yeah? Green is up to here, and it's only a question of about seven years that this part of landscape gardening and agriculture, use for agriculture, will not play a role anymore. Because there's a political uh, paradigm saying we want to um, conserve the phosphate in the sludge. We, so for that reason, we want to mono incinerate the sludge. We're building up a couple of incineration plants. Maybe at the end we have more capacity than we, we need. And um, uh, this process is going on. All that when you come back in five years, it will be different. But this is the thing. Things are moving at the moment. Um, I think for time reasons, I, I skip through the topic of digitalization. Only one point. When I'm talking about digitalization, the German water sector, my German colleagues always tell me, "Oh, be quiet. Don't talk too much." because there are other in Europe much better on that. The Danish are great in all this process of digitalization. We in Germany, sometimes we are fighting with our own rules. Yeah, uh, we are fighting with data protection issues, something like that. There are a couple of things moving. There are good tools you can use, yeah, obviously. Um, but it could be much more, yeah, coming to the really use of data in a centralized form and really saving money and saving resources and saving amounts of infrastructure. <sighs> Maybe in seven years, eight years. But when you want to learn something about um, the IT security in critical infrastructure, and this is about restricting. In this point, we are very good as Johns. Together with the wastewater and uh, wastewater and drinking water, we developed even years ago a guideline how to make uh, or what to have in mind when you are in with your operator with your utility in this transformation phase to digitalization this is the thing i can recommend you um, it's really helpful it's available in english some few words about germ water sector about the stuff we have 15,000 plants drinking water, wastewater. We have one million pipe sewers, and we have about one million drinking water network. Yeah? Um, we have 80 million inhabitants, and we have an annual investment in the sector for 8 billion euro. 8 billion euro is oh, something, no? It's only 10 percent, it's only it's only one percent of the the value of infrastructure, which is about 600, 700 billion euro. So we don't invest even enough money to maintain our infrastructure in, in a good good shape. So a lot of money is in the game. 
Um, and uh, a lot of engineering consulting companies are working in the field. For all this, we have um, 250,000 working in the sector. We have the problem of age in our, uh, in our uh, sector. Yeah, mining area, the people are over more age than we, but the second one is the water sector. So it's a good opportunity. The young people here are on the right track. Um, even to stay in Germany, find your place here. But from the 80,000 working as employees in utilities, yeah, the majority of them is, has a vocational training. Only 15% are academics, 10%, 12 30% are academics. The majority are here technicians with a three years vocational training or a two years add-on technician uh, qualification. This is a basic for all our operational work. Later on, we can go deeper into this point. I think it's again a point where we can discuss easily. easily. I don't know, half a day, one day. I only want to leave you one idea more. To maintain trained these operators, we have the training model of neighborhood. The idea is that the workers, technicians of a couple of plants close to each other, visit once or twice a year one of the plants. They form a fixed group, a fixed peer group of learning. Yeah? And from the headquarter of DWA or DVGW Tamien, uh, too, um, they send a teacher for only one or two hours, but the rest is self-organized. Huh? They have their rhythm, they have their agenda, they have everything as they like, and um, meet once a year, uh, once a, uh, one for one day, and are trained in a continuous way. This is working very fine since oh, 68. So, question about wastewater. Yes. This was about the associations, the associations in mining areas. Yeah. yeah. I would like to know more about mining. Then you come late. Um, <laughs> because this mining in this area, this is uh, carbon deep ground mining, it's not open, it's completely shut down. The, how do you call it, subsidence of the ground, about 50 meters had happened. So the normal flow of the river didn't work anymore. This was a the reason they need a joint attempt to organize all this, uh, this uh, discharge. And now that the role, I have a slide a little bit later um, about uh, restructuring, renaturing all things after, after 100 years of mining activities again. We have the same here on the other hand, close to Cologne, open ditch, open, open ditch mining, no? you call it this big holes. Um, 400 meters deep, there you can uh, get the lignite, the brown coal, yeah? And this will finish even in the next 15, 10 years too. Um, there all, everything is under control, yes. The responsibility for water management in these areas is in the hand of water authorities and the mining, uh, the mining companies, yeah? When you have in the, the old carbon mining area where it shut down, um, the, the mining uh, companies had to make deposits for pumping for the next thousand years, yeah? They call it even the, the budget for um, Lebens, Lebenskosten or Endgültigkeitsressen, costs forever, something like that, yeah? But uh, as a clever businessman of big concerns, uh, a con uh, after a while they got it, after 15 years, 20, 30 years, they got it to be paid out to the, to the public. So the thing is a little bit uh, same as with the atomic power, uh, but at the end it's planned, yeah? And from the beginning and it's planned to have a deposit on that. And it's a challenge for a private company to hold all this under control for 100 years, yeah? <laughs> but at least the idea is there. So, 
maybe discussing that a little bit later. Um, coming to the last point of the circle and having 10 minutes, nine minutes. Yes, some ideas about costs, yeah? These are the different types of costs. We have the principle of full cost recovery in the water sector, and we have the system of polluter pays for industry. Yeah? So we pay our drinking water, the wastewater for normal householders is based on drinking water consumption fee. This is we already know. When you are operator and you, um, uh, you uh, abstract water, you have to pay. When you want to give the water back to the river, you have to pay. Okay, this is budget. With this budget, you can play with you on the right hand um, because the resources management needs some money. Yeah, so we have to make inventory. So this is again Cologne, yeah? Um, of all the wells here around, we make inventories and discharge points and something like that. It's in the hand of the water authority. And some of the money they get out of the abstraction fee, yeah? And um, on the other hand, there is a budget when you have water protection measures and the landowner cannot use this land anymore as he wa wanted before, then there is a uh, compensation fund. Yeah? This is per federal state, so in every federal state it's a little bit different, but the idea exists in all. And this money can be used for that purpose too. In some federal states, you even as a consumer pay some additional money on that. Um, for the wastewater side, we have a different logic. Because for the wastewater side, what we want is that the companies, uh, the, the utilities, improve their services, improve their technology. So there is a wastewater fee or a stormwater fee depends on the grade or the level of contamination. When you contaminate less, you pay less. And when you want to improve your services or your technology, you can borrow money out of this fund, of this, uh, this budget, out of the, uh, from the wastewater, uh, uh, from the wastewater discharge fees. So it's a little bit a circle for permanent improvement in the wastewater sector. It's only to get the idea, nothing more for the moment. So something about rivers. Six big capture areas. Only one is only germ, which is the River Weser over here. All others are transboundary. River Rhine is the biggest. River Elbe is the second one. The Danube one is over here, going to the Black Sea. Yeah? So transboundary water management standard in Germany. Living with the neighbors is important. In the 2000s, European water, the European Union thought in an equivalence to IWM. I would call it like that. Now, this is a, the European Water Framework Directive is an answer of the European Union to integrated water resources management. It's not look completely, don't have the four Dublin principles inside, but it has a purpose to make sure that at least the water is not a commercial product like others, but rather a heritage which must be protected. Yeah? And then how to bring together all this 24, five, I don't know, at that time European state to make transforming from a picture like that to a picture like that. Um, the way it was setting a, union, uh, a joint standard and defining the way. So the European Water Primary Corrective is somehow a milestone plan to come to a situation like that. A milestone plan to come to good chemical status and good ecological status of our rivers, dams, uh, rivers and lakes and something like that. And this is one example. This is just the area I talked about, the carbon uh, uh, mining area, where there was a river like that, which was at the same time the discharge for the sewer because it was not able, possible to put the sewer in the underground because by the uh, uh, um, lowering of the ground due to the excavation of coal, the sewers were broke and moving like that. So this was even to maintain. Now everything is quiet. Now they are caring about renaturation and connecting the old rivers again with, 
This is a project here, again, with nature and things like that, a project for about 30 billion euro. You remember, 8 billion reinvestment in all the water sector a year over 20 years, something like that. Um, no, five, five? Okay, five, wrong number. Uh, five billion euro uh, invested over there in the last 30 years. Yeah. Impressive example. Um, oh, this is about... Uh, uh, this, this is somehow this track of milestones from the European Water Framework Directive. Yeah? And what you have to do as a European country, you have to make a report. The only thing you make reports. This is the only thing the European Union is requiring you. And in the report, you report and you set standards for the next six years. And the next six years after that, you will, they will measure you on the things you have planned six years before because the development status of different countries in Europe is different. So the things are, it's a good way from the organizational point of view, it's a good way to bring 26 countries with different development concepts, different levels of development under one common roof. This European Water Framework Directive is, is uh, unified with some other uh, uh, more specific directives. Between others, there is this Urban Wastewater Dire Treatment Directive I explained to you a little bit. One other is here, Flood Risk Management Directive. And out of that came the idea to develop flood hazard maps. So all over Europe, this is from 2015, something like that, all over Europe now have these flood risk maps. Yeah? And they are openly accessible for all customers. This is a real great, in my student times, we don't have, didn't have this opportunity, but now all this data are public. Um, you have to care about the rivers you see over here, done by water authorities and by consultancies on that. Public awareness is important. You will find this plate in Cologne here behind that is a river Cologne, a river Rhine. And everything is organized. Even the water can rise up to this level here. The city is prepared. Yeah? It's only every five, six, seven years, but the city is prepared. Mobile walls, things like that. Um, this is an example of a smaller river, the River R, which we see in the next picture produced a lot of problems in 2021 because there was heavy storm water. And uh, they really had a lot of dead people over here here you see the curve going up to, to eight meters, I think. No, six meters, but it was a small, a small uh, crack after, before. And this come, came, no, the reason for that was heavy rain for one thing, but the other one, the alarming system didn't work properly. Yeah? So different levels, responsibilities, and no one believing this could happen. So um, all the question of alarming systems nowadays is much, very much improved. This is a way how we handle the risk. Yeah? It's clear, these are dots, it's about 15 years old or 10 years old, this, this, this picture, where the he in one year have appeared the heavy, heavy stormwater um, uh, things. It's not something new. But we are starting improving our conditions um, putting these uh, retention pipes into the ground which permit to store more water. This is under a major place in Munich where they store rainwater to avoid flooding of, of other areas. So, I coming to the end to you, just giving you the idea of these water protection zones. These are some wells close to Hennef and um, this is pro different protecting areas you have with the restriction of land use. Yeah? The same exists for the, uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the for the reservoirs um, where it's very nice, but you may not swim over there. All protected, you can make walks, but nothing more. So far, this was a little bit the idea I wanted to show you. Is there any additional question? One question, and then I think we stop here. Yes, please. Thank you for sharing the amazing water governance system you are mentioning, Germany. And I want to know like, how Germany is also sharing that water governance system, especially with the 
This is two longer questions. <laughs> for, for the decentral concepts, I think it's difficult to share. It's to talk about, and this is deeply anchored in the, in the political system of a country, what responsibility a federal state or a state gives to the municipalities and to the federal states. And I think there is history of Germany involved in the question of all the bad experience we made with Adolf Hitler and the Second, uh, 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 Second, uh, Second World War here. And uh, there, it's, it's a very decentralized, stable system. Um, the other one, I would like, can we discuss it outside with a cup of coffee? Yeah? So then I would say thank you at this point, making the stage free for the next speakers. Thanks for your attendance and enjoy the conference over here.